Welcome to the Garden Angeles, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Dean Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want you to love it too. Yes, we do. And we are also authors and invite you to check out our books, including my books, Potted and Prune, Homegrown and Handpicked, and Seeded and Sodded, my trilogy of gardening humor, and my new book, Creatures and Critters, Who's in My Garden? And my book, The 2030-Something Garden Guide and No Fuss, Down and Dirty, Gardening 101, for anyone who wants to grow stuff. You can ask for any of our books at your favorite bookstore or find them online wherever books are sold. Speaking of online, you can also find us as The Garden Angelist on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and sometimes Pinterest. And we'd love for you to join our Facebook group, The Garden Angelist Garden Club. Now on to this week's episode. Hello, Dee. Hello, Carol. How are you? Great. Happy National Compost Awareness Week. Yes, happy NCAW. And we want everyone to be aware of compost. And we talked about this on an earlier podcast at length, but it's just a reminder. We'll put a link to that episode in case somebody missed it. That's always a good idea. And so this, uh, the other big things this week, of course, we're recording this on Monday. So it's uh, May the 4th be with you. Right. Star Wars week. Star Wars week. tomorrow is Cinco de Mayo is tomorrow, which would be the previous day when people can listen to this. And of course, the big conclusion of the week, Mother's Day. Mother's Day. It's almost Mother's Day. And I just want to say, uh, may the fourth be with you or the force be with you. Um, I actually think of it as Baby Yoda Day, but that's just me because I love Baby Yoda, Baby Yoda and I love The Mandalorian. If you haven't seen it, it's a fun, fun show. Yes, and I like to think of Mother's Day as the day that we can release the hounds to plant, so to speak. In Indiana. Yes, in Indiana. Because you need to have already been planting in Oklahoma. Believe it or not, D, we have some uh, troubling weather forecasts towards the end of the week. Ugh, what? Possibility of frost. Oh, well, you know, we suffered through that for several weeks that it wasn't supposed to be here. But you know what? We all got through it. The garden got through it. Just don't plant those tomatoes yet in your part of the world. That's right. Or the peppers. Or the eggplant. Right. Or the green beans, which we're going to talk about today, sort of. (laughs) Yes. So in my garden this past week, I I did a lot more uh, weeding. Had Mm -hmm. a visitor come over. She did a socially distant visit. That was our friend Katie Elzer-Peters. Yes, I'm so excited that you got to see her. I'd love to see Katie, except for I'd probably want to give her a hug, and there's no hugging right now. But that's okay. She gave me the cutest little rock, and I'll, I'll post a picture of it, I think, on our Facebook group page. Yes, the Garden Angelus Gardening Group. It's from uh, Key West Whimsy, and it's very cute. That is really cute. I'm excited for you. Well, um, in my garden this week, we're watering because we haven't had any rain. It's supposed to get up to 90 degrees today, but then we have more seasonable weather the rest of the week in the 70s, which I'm grateful for. And let's see, what else have I done this week? I've worked steady. Oh, I'm still digging out gold sturm. But here's the good news about that. There's good news? I mean, I'm going to be, yes, I'm going to be digging out gold sturm. I'm leaving it only in one spot, in one border, where it is hedged in by several other things. So I'm hopeful. And I'm going to deadhead that stuff with a passion. But anyway, I digress. Where I have removed it, I've found all this space in my garden to plant other things. And that makes me really happy. And one of the things I planted, well, two of the things I planted, were irises. And, you know, this is the year of the iris. It is the year of the iris. National Garden Bureau. So I planted two old irises. I planted Alcazar and Eleanor Roosevelt. And then I planted an old dahlia. And it's an heirloom dahlia, and it's called Juanita. And I planted that after my grandmother, and we've talked about that before. Right. And I actually planted the irises because of my mother-in-law. I did it for my husband because he loves irises because his mother loved them. And I kind of like the old ones because they aren't quite so flamboyant and heavy, although the new ones are pretty too. But 
I, I'm doing, I'm going back to more of a grandmother's garden, maybe because I'm a grandmother. I don't know. It could be. Well, you want to have a lot of flowers and with scents and that are big and bodacious that your little granddaughter can remember them. Yes, that's part of it because that's why I garden. And so I, I planted these irises and we'll see how they do. It'll be a year or so. Oh, and I also planted Rosa Glauca which we saw last year on the Garden Bloggers Fling. Did you go on the Fling last year? I did year? not, so I did not okay, see it. Okay, so you did not see it, but I saw it. So um, I love their blue, reddish-blue leaves, and I love the single flowers. And so good for the bees, good for my garden, not a native rose, but a simple rose. And we're gonna, and I put all those irises underneath them. So we'll see what happens. It's, it's a new area of the garden, a garden rehab, as it were. Very nice. Well, I'm not ready to plant. Like I said, I've been weeding. And I noticed that Katie took a picture of an iris in my garden. And I have these little dwarf irises, which are like your grandmother's big ones. But they're dwarfs. And they bloom now. And I thought, oh, they're blooming over there. I should go check it out. You should. Why don't you take a picture of them while they're over there? You can send it to me. And we'll I will. post it. All right. So those are our garden updates. And then I have a poem, not just a quote, but a whole poem, because I thought right now it was the perfect thing because we are still suffering with the corona, as my family calls it. Each time you look up in the sky or watch the fluffy clouds drift by or feel the sunshine warm and bright or watch the dark night turn to light or hear a bluebird gaily sing or see the water turn to spring, or stop to pick a daffodil, or gather violets on some hill, or touch a leaf or see a tree. It's all God whispering, this is me, and I am faith, and I am light, and in me there shall be no night. And that's by Helen Steiner Rice. And I actually saw a piece of it on Facebook and thought it was beautiful, but it was mis- it was actually misquoted. And since it was misquoted, I, I thought we would do the whole entire poem. Well, that was beautiful. And I, you know, I went out today early in the morning because it was, um, the birds were singing really loudly and I saw my bluebird out there. Yeah, I've seen a bunch of blue, you know, right now here they are nesting. And Same so here. we're about three weeks ahead of you guys because they're about to fledge. But the boy bluebirds have just been singing. And there's no song like the Bluebird song, right? There is no song like it, although I couldn't replicate it for you. No, we could not replicate it for you. <laughs> but just go listen to one of the bird sites and you'll hear the Bluebird song. And you had a video on Instagram and Facebook this week talking about the plant we're going to talk about for our flower, and that's the coral honeysuckle. Yeah, Lenincera the coral honeysuckle. Lanicera sempervirens. Yes. I say Lanicera. But it's Lenincera. I always say Lenincera. You're adding another N to it. <laughs> I'm teasing, though. Um, so it's native to the southeastern U.S., and I learned something new this week. Both of mine are coral and orange, so they're those color, that color grouping. And a lady asked me if it comes in any other colors, and I said, I don't think so, but I didn't really go look because I'll be honest, I'm inundated with garden questions right now, and I was thinking, no, I don't think so. Well, we have a native plant specialist. We have several of them in the state of Oklahoma, but one of them, she follows me, and I've bought a lot of plants from her, Marilyn Stewart, and she came on and just gently said, there's a yellow one. So you can also get this in yellow if you want to. I don't have it in yellow. I have it in both corals, um, Major Wheeler and Dropmore Scarlet are the varieties I have. You know, and I don't have either one, but there's probably no reason why not. Other than you should grow I just, it. Well, I kind of need a big arbor to grow it on because it's a pretty big vine. It does get pretty big. One thing I want to say about it is it's native and it doesn't get, it's not like Asian honeysuckle or Japanese honeysuckle. Um, it doesn't like overwhelm structures. It's not invasive in the landscape. It is a super duper pollinator attractor, which is great. My honeybees love it. My carpenter bees love it. Um, hummingbirds love it. Major Wheeler blooms first, so it's already almost finished. And Dropmore Scarlet is the one I featured in the post this week, the video. And boy, it is just covered with bees. And then in the evening, the hummingbirds come too. It is also 
the host plant for the clearwing moth, the snowberry clearwing. Do you get snowberry clearwing moths in your garden? You know, if I do, I don't know much. It's a type. It. Okay, so it's a type of hummingbird moth. Uh-huh. And they, there, it's the hummingbird moth that has the clear. It has a, a like a border around its wing that's dark and then clear underneath. And I take a lot of pictures of it because it also loves Phlox paniculata. The adults do, but the babies love coral honeysuckles. So what a great plant, right? Oh, it is a great plant, and it is. Uh, I just checked. It is hardy to zone nine. So other than finding a space for a fairly vigorous vine, I don't sure. I'm not sure why I'm not growing it. Well, you say it's hardy to zone nine. What about the cold hardiness? That's the cold hardiness. To just zone nine? Yeah, I'm six. So zone four. Why was I saying nine? I meant four. Yeah, I was like, wait a minute, zone nine. So it's four to nine, right? Four to nine. My my, I visualized a four and said nine. Don't don't judge people. Don't judge. That's okay. We no, don't judge when you're over 50. Golly, I do it all the time. So, um, don't plant Asian honeysuckle. I have Asian honey. I'm not saying that to you, I'm saying that to our listeners. It is really invasive throughout the entire south. I don't know, is it invasive up where you live? It is horribly invasive. Okay. And I'll tell people this is how you'll notice it. First of all, it's the first thing to green up in the woods in the spring, so you'll see all this green and it's invasive honeysuckle and it's the last thing to turn in the fall it doesn't really have color right so the leaves have all dropped and there's those dumb green leaves and it is terribly invasive and you you have to pry those things out of there it is horrible and speaking of it i have some of it i have some of it by accident because bill's grandmother grew it and when i first moved in with bill 32 years ago um it lived here and i have dug it I have sprayed it. I have even used the dim- the dreaded chemical on it. I've used the strongest version of the chemical on it. I've dug it some more. I still have it. I have it now beaten back to this one little area, and then I chop it back as soon as it blooms so that it doesn't spread seed. But right. I can't get rid of it. And, I mean, I have really tried, Carol. Oh, I believe you. And, you know, back in the 70s when I took classes on trees and shrubs at Purdue – I mean, it was it was listed as a landscape plant, and that people would plant it in hedges and things, and then they figured out how horrible it was. So, I mean, it's horrible, and so um, even if you see it for sale somewhere, which you shouldn't, but somebody might give you oh some God, of it. No. Um, please don't take it. It's like so many things over the years that have lived that I'm still beating back in my garden. So. But back to the vine that you have, and I might look for that. My sister's looking for a vigorous vine to put on an arbor. Maybe I'll suggest that one. It's a really good one. And I was also going to say that, uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> I was going to say that it is it is not as vigorous as some of the other varieties. It's just right vigorous. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. And when it quits, and when it quits blooming, it has blue green foliage. At least Drotmore Scarlet does. And I, oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, someone, a lot of people ask me where they could get it because anytime you show something flashy on Instagram, people want it. Obviously, me too. Right. Um, right. And I, I had to order all of mine. I do think it's for sale at Prairie Wind Nursery down in Norman, and Marilyn Stewart may have it too. But I had to order both of mine. Just FYI. Yeah, and I actually. Um, I do have a variegated honeysuckle vine. Interesting. Yeah, it, and it is uh it's a it's a hybrid of some sort and I I kind of think that it is not native. Yeah, I grew because, one that was um called sweet tea that was a real pretty pink and yellow and it was very sad here and finally I just dug it out cuz it was unhappy. Is yours happy? Yeah, it's your harlequin one. No. It is extremely unhappy, and partly is because it is in a terrible location, kind of hidden behind this other shrub, so it's got to grow a long way to kind of get to the sun, and I thought, I need to figure out if that's worth keeping, well, figure out if it's harlequin or which one, and if it turns out it's native, I'll probably keep it. If it turns out it's not native, I'll probably just go ahead and put it out of its misery. Yeah. 
But it has beautiful foliage. I bet. I bet it's really pretty. I thought sweet tea was beautiful, too. Um, it was not native. I thought it was really pretty, but it just wasn't happy. And I, I'm, a, I'm over that. I am over plants that are not happy here. I let them go. Yeah. There's a fine balance in gardening between plants that are unhappy that you keep trying to grow because you want to expand your horizons and plants that are too happy, like Goldstorm Rebecca in my garden. Right. So have we kind of given that a good trial run and now we're moving on to our veggie? Yeah, we're yeah. Let's move on to our veggie because we had a bit of a rant in there, and then Carol confessed that she has a plant in a terrible location that has to be dug out. Yeah. Um. So we we should move on. I have a humorous quote for us. Go ready. Go for it. A bag of birdie bots every flavor beans. You want to be careful with those, Ron warned Harry. When they say every flavor, they mean every flavor. You know, you get all the ordinary ones like chocolate and peppermint and marmalade, but then you can get spinach and liver and tripe. George reckons he had a booger-flavored one once. Ew. Ron, Ron picked up a green bean, looked at it carefully, and bit into a corner. <laughs> See? Sprouts. And that's by J.K. Rowling from Harry Potter. It, that's right. The, the beans, those beans make me laugh. That's a good one. I love that one. That is good. And a... They're not obviously referring to green bean, the vegetable. Obviously. They're talking about a bean that is green. And they're talking about jelly beans. Right. Mm-hmm. Which we've had those before. And there's one that tastes, oh. There's even a game. Did you know there's a game? Yeah, there's a game and you have to eat it. And then, you know, people get the ones that taste horrible. And I think that some people have almost like, well, it's, we're going yeah, to talk about matter. green beans in the garden. And the thing, we've talked about them before, and we're going to link to that previous episode. The thing that we wanted to talk about today was why you should plant green beans the next year where you once planted corn or tomatoes. Right. And that is because? Nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen fixation. That's right. The legume family. That's the short version. You're going to give the longer version, which you got from New Mexico State University. Right. Legumes and a few other plants, they have a bacteria that lives in small growths on their roots called nodules. And within those nodules, nitrogen fixation is done by the bacteria. And then the uh, nitrogen that is produced is absorbed by the plant. And so that's why they plant beans after corn. Right, it's all part of that crop rotation thing. So you don't want to plant tomatoes or corn or heavy feeders like eggplant or peppers in the same place every year, not only because they're heavy feeders, but also because they get diseases, blah, blah, blah. We talk about this a lot. So if you plant in your crop rotation, you also plant legumes. That's a good thing. It is a very good thing. And legumes include uh, mostly the green beans, but also peas are legumes. Mm -hmm. Also, beans like um, pinto beans. Pinto beans. um, You can plant edamame, which are, I call those edible soybeans, even though all soybeans are edible. Those are the ones you would serve green. Right. In their pods, and then you squish them out and eat them. They're yummy. Um, So all beans are legumes. um, Peas are legumes. And green beans you plant, well, not yet in Indiana, but you can plant them now in Oklahoma. So, and you can plant them directly from seed. A few years ago, a company, which we shall not name, had those crazy pods that had little bean seeds inside of them so that you could grow the plant in the pod first and then transplant it outside. And they had that for like cucumbers, green beans. Oh my God. Um, corn, I think. And none of those, none of those have to be planted as transplants. You can just put those bean seeds directly in the garden. And the cool thing is, is if you're gardening with children, which a lot of people are right now because their children are home from school, beans are a great thing to plant with kids. Right. Big seed, quick to germinate. Um, And then they're also good to pick and eat raw in the, when they're tiny. Yes. In fact, I was reading, what book was I reading? Oh, no, it wasn't a book. I was watching Alice Waters do a piece on masterclass. 
And she was talking about her daughter, and she was actually talking about salad greens and strawberries, things that you put in the garden that are just so good and ephemeral. You know, there's got that little short season. Right. And she was saying that she made a teepee for her daughter when she was little with pole beans, with green beans that are pole beans. And she said her daughter would just walk in and snap off a bean and eat it. And it's really good. I mean, it, it's really good, especially when they're young. It is very good. And we've talked before about our favorite varieties. Mine is Provider, which is a not long, yes. long, straight bean, very prolific plant. And I like any of the Blue Lake varieties. There's a lot of other beans I like too, but the Blue Lake varieties have great yields, good disease resistance because they're always coming out with a new one with more disease resistance. Um, they are also very round and not fuzzy, which is one of my husband's big requirements. And we talk about that in the other episode too. Right. And I always plant bush beans. I don't bother with pole beans. Do you bother with pole beans? I don't bother with them right now. I have in the past. I had really good success with a purple pole bean. And I don't remember which variety it was, but it had nice round pods. It was really pretty. And it made a beautiful plant because it was a, you know, it had purple beans on it. And the blooms were purple too. So... My attitude is, is if you want to grow a pole bean and you want it to be really pretty, grow a purple one. You can also grow Blue Lake. I think there's a Blue Lake pole bean too. I know Kentucky Wonder has one. Yeah, Kentucky Wonder. And really, I'm, I don't want to say anything bad about Kentucky Wonder, but there are a lot of better green beans than that one. <laughs> True. I agree. So It's not the best one. No. So I, I like pole beans, but... Um, I don't know. I think bush beans are easy. Oh, and one of the beans I really like is dragon tongue. It's a flat bean, more like an Italian type, but it has beautiful purple and yellow speckles. It's a very pretty bean. Yes. So if you want something pretty, that's a good one to grow. And I have some old seed from from dragon's tongue that I'm going to sow in the garden. And the one thing I'll say about green beans, and this is something I do try to do, is plant shorter rows and space them out about a week to 10 days apart. Otherwise, you have a lot of green beans to eat at once. Or, I mean, they're easy to blanch and freeze, but you want to extend that harvest on green beans especially because they'll produce all summer once they get going. Yeah, yeah, they will. I mean, here they get viruses eventually and kind of peter out. Um, you also want to pick them regularly because once they have produced beans with seeds that are more mature they quit producing yeah they go so, ta-da i'm done i have produced seed <laughs> that's pretty much what they do and a lot of plants are like that that's why people think vegetable gardens are among the easiest things to grow but i don't agree i think they're actually um a lot more work because you have to be out there working in them exactly <laughs> All right. Are you going to say anything about yellow wax beans? Um, just, I grow yellow wax beans. It's just more out of do habit. Do you grow than Cherokee? Any... No. No? Just Which one it. do you grow? Do you know? It's called yellow wax. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Well, Cherokee, I think, is another one. So, got a quote for us? For I do. Next section. However many years she lived, Mary always felt that she should never forget that first morning when her garden began to grow. Frances Hodgson Burnett. That's from The Secret Garden. It is. It is. I love I love The Secret Garden, and I go and I pick it up periodically and just read sections of it. That's yes. the truth. That's the truth. So uh, that, that leads us into our On the Bookshelf. And this right. week we chose... A book we haven't we haven't talked about this book at all. No. Which so I'll be interested to hear what you think about it. It's Kitchen Garden Revival. It's by Nicole John Z. Burke of Gardenary. That's her handle on Instagram. She's quite famous on Gardenary because she does some really good videos showing time lapse and speed videos. So she's much um, much more professional at it than I am. Or I just I, than I am. I just do whatever I want to do. Because yeah. you know what? It's just Instagram. So I want to know what you thought of it. Well, I just have barely begun to look at it. And I think it is a beautiful little book. And once it again, is. the she makes gardens beautiful, kitchen gardens beautiful. And mm. so I think that any book that you can use to show people how a garden can be beautiful and 
you know, not set off away from the landscape, but become part of the whole persona of the landscape, so to speak. I think that's a wonderful thing. I do too. And she has really great information in this book about how to build raised beds, arbors, and other things to have a true kitchen garden. And this is more of a European style of gardening, which has come to the United States. It's It has been slow to come to the middle of the United States. It's been really popular in California for a long, long time right? because of some really great writers and such. Um, but Nicole actually installs gardens for other people. And so a lot of the gardens, she has her garden in here, her kitchen garden, but these are also gardens that she installed for other folks. And I thought her scientific information as far as how to actually build things was spot on. And what's interesting is I had this book out because I was going to read it for our deal because we received a free copy from uh, Quartro or Cool Springs. That's the same company. And I had it sitting on my bar in the kitchen and I was cooking vegetables, among other things. And Bill started looking at it. And as you know, Bill and I have built a lot of gardens over the years. And I have a kitchen garden, my potage. And you have a kitchen garden because you had yours redesigned right. a few years ago. And Bill was looking at this and he said, this is a really good book. Now that was from Bill and Bill helps me build all this stuff. So she gives you really good information. Um, she shows you the tools to use. She tells you about mistakes she's made, what kind of soil you should put in these gardens, which I get questions about all the time. Um, how to revamp them when they're tired, how you should water. So it has a lot of the same information I had in my book. My book is more for the beginner. Her book is more for if you're, in my opinion, if you're more advanced, if you're ready to make that step to having it not just be a rectangle in the earth where you plant things, right? Right. She talks about um, drip irrigation, watering with um, a watering can. She has almost the exact same picture I do of a timer attached to a hose because I have a whole section in my book about that. I I was really impressed. Then She has sections on vegetables too. It's a good book, Carol. It is a good book. One of book. the best ones we've seen. Yes, and it's uh, very well timed for somebody that's kind of struggling to get their garden really looking its best and being a little bit more confident about what they're doing, this would be a good book to pick up. Because I don't know if it's like this in Indiana, but in summer in Oklahoma, gardens can go straight to Hades really fast. You know, in Indiana, the same can happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here it happens because people don't think about how they're going to water and they don't weed and they don't plant their gardens in the sun. Or they plant them in the sun and then don't water and weed. And those, and I don't want to oversimplify things, but before you start any kind of a vegetable garden or flower garden, you need to think about how you're going to water in Oklahoma. I say that in every talk I give. You need to think about that in Indiana as well, because we have some periods of dryness, um, especially if you get into August. Sometimes June can be sort of dry. July, we get a pretty good amount of rain in July. But, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> And by the way, in Oklahoma, it's a period of dryness from about, uh, it could be from May to September, or it could be from June to September. It just depends. And so you got to be ready. Right. And I, you know, the thing is, I never refer to my garden as a kitchen garden because it's actually the back third of the backyard. You know what I call my vegetable garden now, don't you? I forgot. The vegetable garden cathedral. Oh, that's right. The Vegetable Garden Cathedral. Yeah, well, mine's not that lofty. I call mine the potage. Um, but you know what? It's They're both kitchen gardens because it's not... I've been in your yard. It's not that far away from your house. No, it's not. And so, but by calling... I mean, I, I want it to live up to its name, the Kitchen Garden Cathedral. It is a pretty garden. It really is. So you know what this book did to me? I I saw on your notes... <laughs> Now I want some want, too. I want arbors in my potage, and I could do it because I've got the four bed potage that's very formal, and I've put lavender around most of the edges, and I keep adding more lavender. But oh, now I want arbors too, which is exactly opposite of how she says to do it. But you know, 
Everybody, I, I'll have to, Bill goes, well, you have a measuring tape. Go measure where your arbor needs to go. But if I put in an arbor now, I will have to deal with uh, moving some plants. And I'll have to think about where I want it. My back garden has quite a few arbors, five, which is a lot, you would think. But it's a big garden. So arbors would fit in in my kitchen garden. I'll have to think about it. Yes, true. So we're almost out of time. So you want to park our dirt <laughs> until next week? Yeah, because we talked too much about this book, and it was awesome. Yes, and now I've got to go look online for arbors and see, you know, where I could get one. (laughs) (laughs) Always glad to enable you, Carol. Because I'm thinking, oh, that's what the cathedral is missing. It's missing an arbor. And I could plant it so that the arbor starts in one bed and goes over to the next bed, and you can walk through it. I know the perfect yeah, that's spot exactly, for an arbor. Yeah, that's exactly where that arbor should go. Exactly. And then, you could pro- and then what would you plant on it? Would you plant pole beans or something else? You know, I would probably, just for decoration, I would plant hyacinth beans because of the red foliage and beautiful flowers. Yes, and they are pretty. I, you know what else I might suggest? Coral honeysuckle. Heavenly, <laughs> no, heavenly, no, I think that'd be too big for a kitchen arbor. How about heavenly blue morning glories? Wouldn't that be pretty? That would, but then I might have morning glories everywhere. Well, you'd have to scratch them out, but that's not that hard. No. Anyway. We digress. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening to The Garden Angelist. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others, and it forces up that algorithm so that our podcast actually gets listened to. Yes, and be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. It was lovely to chat with you over the Garden Gate today. Bye until next week. Bye.